Some see a city. We see a 300 square mile residence, currently shared by over eight and a half million people who have made it their own. From kings and trailblazers, to explorers and visionaries. Generations of the most influential families and some of the most colorful characters. Engaging eyewitnesses, eye-opening discoveries, and even some animals. After centuries of remodeling, we can't imagine living anywhere else. It's more than a city. To us, it's home. Welcome home. We're glad you're here. We thought it was a good time to talk with some of the artists who we have worked with. It wasn't so much the mask that really got to me, it was the eyes. Because you see that primal fear in people. We kind of question the fundamental information that are asked on the senses. It was almost like a, a ritual that you get up in the morning and you get to the park by 10 o'clock, 9.30, and you don't leave until, until sunset, sundown. Some see a city. We see a 300 square mile residence, currently shared by over eight and a half million people who have made it their own. From kings and trailblazers, to explorers and visionaries. Generations of the most influential families and some of the most colorful characters. Engaging eyewitnesses, eye-opening discoveries, and even some animals. After centuries of remodeling, we can't imagine living anywhere else. It's more than a city. To us, it's home. Welcome home. We're glad you're here. We thought it was a good time to talk with some of the artists who we have worked with. It wasn't so much the mask that really got to me, it was the eyes. Because you see that primal fear in people. We kind of question the fundamental information that are asked on the senses. It was almost like a, a ritual that you get up in the morning and you get to the park by 10 o'clock, 9.30, and you don't leave until, until sunset, sundown. 
minutes and is planned so that if people come in in the last two, that's fine. So. Okay, so then you could cut it down even if you wanted. All right, I'm gonna go broadcast. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's program. Thank you for joining us. We're going to allow a couple of minutes for people to continue signing in as our broadcast begins. Dan, you might want to mute yourself while Maeve is speaking just to reduce feedback. Hello, yes, I see some folks are saying hello in the chat. It's good to see you. I see some, some familiar names, so many new folks joining us today. Again, we are now live and we're waiting just two more minutes as we allow people to find the link and come on in to the program. We're very excited to be here with all of you this evening. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Hello and welcome again. Thank you again. We're just giving another moment while we people come on in to our Zoom room here with us. It's wonderful to see so many of you. Thanks for saying hello in the chat as well. I always love seeing all the places people are saying hello from. All right, Dan, you're getting some hellos as well. All right, so we are going to begin. And thank you again for joining us, everyone. We're very excited to be able to have this next iteration of our ongoing series of virtual programming. So hello and welcome to this evening's broadcast. I'm Maeve Montalvo, Director of Education at the Museum of the City of New York. And it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker and to provide some context for this talk, which is entitled Criminals Among Us, Fingerprinting and Criminal Background Checks in Pre-World War II New York City. This program is one of many offerings from the Museum of the City of New York. And I'll begin by taking a few moments to situate the museum and share a bit about what we do. The Museum of the City of New York's mission, our mission, is to foster understanding of the distinctive nature of urban life in what we, oh so humbly, but also earnestly, consider to be the greatest metropolis in and the most influential metropolis in the world. We engage visitors by celebrating, documenting, and interpreting the city's past so that we can understand our present and prepare for our future. For those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to visit the museum, the museum is located on 104th Street and Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, where it has stood for almost 100 years. Once our building reopens, I encourage you to come by. <laughs> 
You can also visit us virtually at www.mcny.org, where you can view our online exhibitions. These include Activist New York, which explores the history of activism in New York City from the 1600s through today, examining over these 400 years issues of political and civil rights, religious freedom, immigration, gender equality, environmental advocacy, and economic rights, as it provides a sweeping look at the passions and conflicts that underlie our city's history of agitation and the New Yorkers who have mobilized to fight for the city that they want to see. This is also a census year, and you can view our exhibition, Who We Are, Visualizing NYC by the Numbers, which sheds light on our city's relationship to the census and showcases cutting edge work by contemporary artists and designers. A quick plug, please fill out the census. And to learn why it is so crucial to do so, you can visit our exhibition. Finally, now also on the outside of our building and discussed online, you can see New York Responds, our newest and ongoing exhibition at this moment of crisis and change that asks you to share your stories of how our city is experiencing both the COVID-19 pandemic and against this backdrop, this talk provides additional historical context so that we may gain insight into how our society operates today. Our speaker this evening, Dan Ewart, has been working at the museum for a full year now in the museum's Frederick A.O. Schwartz Education Center as an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Predoctoral Fellow in History Education. The museum's education center serves nearly 50,000 people annually, from students to educators to families and community members. As part of our efforts to present content rich, valuable and innovative programming that explores the history of the city and helps us better understand our present. We have been fortunate to have a team of fellows working as scholar educators in the education department. These emerging scholars who are currently getting their PhDs in history and the humanities conduct research and assist with curriculum writing while simultaneously getting hands-on experience in teaching as they work directly with thousands of school children and educators across the city. It is with gratitude that I thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which supports this fellowship in history education. The Frederick A.O. Schwartz Education Center is also supported by grants from the Thompson Family Foundation Fund, the F.A.O. Schwartz Family Foundation, the William Randolph Hearst Endowment, and other generous donors. Tonight's speaker is one of these scholar educators I mentioned through this fellowship, and I shared all of this preamble with you to provide insight into why we are thrilled that tonight he can share his scholarship with you in this public lecture, which is the capstone or final project of his fellowship year. Dan Ewart is a PhD candidate in American history at Princeton University, specializing in policing, the carceral state, and urban history. His dissertation, tentatively titled The Civil Cage, Criminal Records, and the American Shadow Carceral State, 1900 to 1980, explores the proliferation of criminal background checks and the mass fingerprinting of Americans during the 20th century which routed American social identity through the nation's expanding law enforcement apparatus. Dan holds a BA in history from Yale University and before graduate school, he worked as a public defense investigator in Brooklyn, as well as an educator at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in Manhattan. In his talk, Criminals Among Us, Fingerprinting and Criminal Background Checks in Pre-World War II New York City, Dan will share his original doctoral research. As he puts it, criminal background checks are now a routine part of applications for many jobs, licenses, and government benefits. But for nearly a century, New Yorkers have debated whether such checks are a tool for protecting the public or a form of legalized discrimination against people with a criminal record. This evening, Dan will explore this conversation 
as he sheds light on New York City's leading role in implementing criminal background checks in the early 20th century, when organized labor, communities of color, and government officials debated the value of fingerprinting and background checks in a, diver in a diverse city of strangers against the backdrop of the Great Depression and the lead up to World War II. Many of you joining this broadcast are educators. Welcome. If you are interested in obtaining a CTLE certificate from this talk, please be sure to complete and fill out the survey, which will be emailed to you at the address you used to register for this talk after the program this evening. For everyone, tonight's talk speaks as one example of the ongoing necessity to share histories like this with our students and with our neighbors so that we can better understand the world in which we live. The Museum of the City of New York is committed to sharing the many histories and many voices of our city, past and present. A few final notes here as we begin. The research Dan is going to share with us this evening is his own doctoral research, pulling together the work of many scholars and adding his own scholarship on top. As Dan's work is not yet published, we will not be sharing the slides for this talk. However, Knowing that many of you will want the resources from it, he has graciously prepared a very detailed lecture outline and additional resources for further study. You can find this document ready for download now on the event's webpage. And at the conclusion of his talk, which will be about an hour, we will hold space for a moderated question and answer section where if you are viewing this through Zoom, you will be able to add your questions to the Q&A section. The Q&A, for those of you who are viewing through Zoom, is at the, should be at the bottom of your screens, and it is a place to put public questions. My colleagues and I will be watching the Q&A section throughout the entire talk, so please feel free to add any of your questions as we go. With that, it's time to begin tonight's program. So, from every one of our computer screens across the five boroughs and beyond, please join me in welcoming Dan Ewart. Dan, thank you for sharing your scholarship with us this evening. All right, thank you for that introduction, Maeve, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure to share some of my early dissertation research from my ongoing project about the role of fingerprinting and criminal background checks during the earlier 20th century. And my hope is that this will be kind of a contribution to our larger discussion about criminal justice reform in the wake of George Floyd's killing two months ago. Um, my interest in this topic began when I moved to New York City six years ago to take a job as a public defense investigator for one of the public defense agencies in Brooklyn. And in my year and a half in that role, I spent a lot of time working with hundreds of low-income clients around Brooklyn who found themselves facing criminal charges. And I'd say the most striking part of that job was seeing the human costs that our criminal justice system places on ordinary people. In particular, my clients often found themselves in the very difficult place of making impossible decisions about their cases. Should they take a criminal plea or risk a longer sentence by taking their case to trial? And if they did take a criminal plea, how might that impact their access to all kinds of benefits long after their sentence, sentence was served? Um, things like driver's licenses, custody over children, and even holding on to immigration status in the United States are often contingent on a person's criminal record. And in these moments, a lot of my clients found themselves faced with the prospect of forever being defined by some of the worst moments in their lives by taking on the status of convicted criminal. Unfortunately, this isn't an uncommon situation in the United States today. It's pretty well known that since the 1970s, the United States has dramatically expanded policing and prisons. And today the incarceration rate is nearly three times what it was 50 years ago. Today, the United States is also the largest incarcerator per capita of any country in the world. So if you look at this chart, you can see the United States way up here on top with an incarceration rate that's about five to 10 times higher than it is in Western European countries. 
I think this problem is pretty well understood, but a lot of people don't think much about how the consequences of this tough on crime system follow people for the rest of their lives. So every year about 600,000 inmates are released from prisons and jails across the United States. And today something like 77 million people, uh, that's about one in three American adults, has a criminal record of some kind. Largely due to disproportionate policing and sentencing, black men are especially likely to be labeled as criminals in the United States. So as you can see in this graph from the New York Times, while one in 10 American men has a felony record, the uh, rate of felony convictions for black men is about two and a half times as high. And as you can see, that rate has been growing rapidly since the 1980s. This is a time when street crime has been declining at the same time. The reason this is relevant is because over the last 100 years, lawmakers and employers have imposed all kinds of measures that make life harder for people with criminal records, inc including widespread criminal background checks that limit their access to everything from employment, housing, welfare benefits, university admissions, and even voting rights. So by taking a look at this uh, map from the National Inventory of Collateral Consequences of Conviction, we can see that in many states there are over a thousand different restrictions that apply to people with criminal records. Across the country, the National Inventory documents more than 40,000 different government restrictions that limit access of people with criminal records to things like jobs, licenses, and education. Beyond these government restrictions, private employers also routinely screen out applicants solely on the basis of their criminal record, even if their criminal record has very little to do with the job they're applying for. Several recent studies cited by the National Employment Law Project have shown that by the time a typical former inmate reaches their peak earning years, they will have earned nearly $200,000 less than they would have if they'd never been incarcerated. And this makes it very difficult for people with a criminal record to ever achieve financial independence. Even as background checks like these have become a routine part of American life, it remains unclear whether they provide any significant measure of protection to the public. In fact, this system of second-class citizenship for people with criminal records is, in the words of legal scholar James Jacobs, quote, so deeply entrenched that it's rarely defended or even explained. What's more, the United States is fairly unique among its peer nations in the degree to which a person's criminal record matters beyond criminal courts and police stations. In a comparative study on the United States and Western Europe, Jacobs found that in many European countries, sharing a person's criminal record with employers is relatively rare, um, largely due to privacy laws in the European Union that protect access to criminal records. I'd like to take a moment to ask all of you to think about whether you've ever been through a background check before. If you don't have a criminal record, I'm guessing you might not even remember it. You probably checked a box on an application like this one, saying that you've never been convicted of a crime and never had to think twice about it. Or maybe you've even been fingerprinted for a job or a license without much hesitation. And given that we have a lot of educators in our audience tonight, I'm guessing many of you have been fingerprinted for a teaching license. It's likely that many of us have been through a criminal background check without even knowing about it since today employers can easily search online databases for people's criminal histories. For those of us here tonight who do have a criminal record though, I'm guessing that these were probably moments of deep anxiety and stress. It's very hard to know what potentially damning information exists about you out there, whether it's accurate and complete, and how or when it might be used to deny you a job or some other benefit in the future. So to summarize, researchers and journalists studying this complex system today have characterized it as one that places restrictions on tens of millions of Americans, is questionably effective at protecting the public, and is quite a bit different from how other Western democracies handle criminal records. And to me, that begs a historical question. How did we get here? My dissertation project has led me to some really interesting places in trying to answer this question. And because I'm a historian, I try and look beyond recent policy changes and instead answer this question in the context of longer and deeper changes 
in the way that we think about identity and criminality. My research suggests that the way we treat people with criminal records today has its origins and changes that began with the Industrial Revolution about 200 years ago. And we can think of the Industrial Revolution as a time of rapid population growth, mass migration as people left agricultural lifestyles and moved into cities, immigration across national borders, and rising class divisions as people lived among strangers in growing cities. Faced with these rapid social and economic changes, older systems for keeping track of individual people based on personally recognizing them or sharing social ties with them weren't up to the task any longer. So bureaucrats had to invent new systems to keep track of individual identity in a complex society where we often live shoulder to shoulder with strangers. We can see this trend toward documentation of identity in the dozens of forms of identification we routinely use today. A driver's license, a passport, an NYC ID, a birth certificate, a professional license, a social security number, a library card, a workplace ID, and several password protected email and social media accounts, to name just a few examples. Many of these forms of identification have a pretty recent history and emerge to keep track of people for a specific purpose or context in this complex society of unknown people that we all live in today. And we can think of this as a system where documentation of a person's identity supplemented or replaced older systems based on a person's reputation or on personally knowing someone. One of the most important of these forms of documentation and the focus of my research for the last couple of years was fingerprinting, a technique that took advantage of the fact that we all have unique marks on the tips of our fingers to track people's identity. Many of us today might associate fingerprinting with forensics and solving crime, like dusting for fingerprints and kind of CSI type applications. But in its early days, fingerprinting was far more important to law enforcement as a tool for quickly and reliably connecting an unknown person to past records collected about them. Fingerprinting was then and still is today an especially appealing form of identification because it can identify someone even if they're trying to lie about their identity or actively trying to conceal who they are. And this made it especially valuable for the rapidly expanding police departments of the late 19th and early 20th century, who could fingerprint an arrested suspect and search for matching fingerprints in their files to locate their entire past criminal record. Today, when we think about identity and privacy, we might think about the internet and computer databases. But what I wanna to stress tonight is that even in a time before computers, law enforcement system of criminal identification became a quite sophisticated an efficient way to keep track of individual people, even analog age of filing cabinets and paper records. And just to give you a sense of the scale of this, this is the FBI's database of fingerprint records during World War II, which by the end of the war grew to contain more than 90 million fingerprint cards. This new capability to collect and centralize records posed really important questions about how and how much information should be collected and used about individual people. As criminal records grew more comprehensive and efficient during the early 19th century, uh, sorry, early 20th century, Americans began debating whether these records should also be used for purposes beyond law enforcement. So by the 1920s and 1930s, law enforcement and business leaders argued that it might be useful for government agencies or even private employers to know whether someone they're working with had a criminal record. And to this end, the federal government, many states and dozens of municipalities around the country began experimenting with fingerprinting applicants for benefits like jobs, immigration visas, and some welfare programs. So let me differentiate between these two systems because they're related but slightly different. Criminal fingerprinting involved fingerprinting suspects who'd been arrested and using those fingerprints to search in their criminal records to see if they had a criminal past. Applicant fingerprinting instead meant fingerprinting people applying for a job or a license, using those fingerprints to run them through the criminal system. And if they did have a criminal record in that search, 
using that criminal record to deny them the benefit that they're applying for. So again, these are slightly different systems, but they're deeply interrelated. Tonight, I'm gonna to share with you some of my discoveries about how the system of criminal background checks spread long before the uptick in mass incarceration later in the 20th century. And because I'm offering this lecture through the Museum of the City of New York, I'll focus this exploration on New York City's unique role in this story during the Great Depression, where one of the nation's most advanced police departments battled with the city's large, diverse working class over the proper limits of how criminal records should be used. What I hope to show tonight is that modern background checks emerged from new techniques of criminal identification at the turn of the last century and extended these records from law enforcement in the areas of civil life like employment, welfare, and immigration. These background checks reinforce the idea that people with a criminal past were likely to reoffend again after their sentence, sentence was served, making them unfit for certain jobs and benefits. The expansion of background checks was highly controversial, and they were often imposed during times of perceived emergency. And finally, uh, background checks sometimes replaced more contextual ways of screening applicants. And this is stuff that we'll flesh out later in the talk tonight, but I'm just giving you a, a preview of where we're headed. My hope is that this historical perspective will help us understand that our current way of doing things is the result of a specific historical moment. And I think this system is ours to reimagine when experience shows us that its costs outweigh the benefits it was intended to provide. Let me give you a roadmap of what we'll cover in the next 45 minutes or so. I'll begin tonight by considering the problem of criminal identification and why new systems emerged to keep track of criminal suspects during the Industrial Revolution. We'll look at different techniques used to track suspects in different periods and why fingerprinting emerged as an efficient, but I think ultimately flawed and limited way of thinking about criminal identity. I'll then show you two case studies from my research on New York City in the 1930s. The first involves a shocking murder that played upon deep anxieties roiling just under the surface of depression era New York City, which led to a controversial effort to fingerprint service workers in the city's large diverse working class. I'll then present a second case study involving the fingerprinting of work relief recipients in the Works Progress Administration, which touched off a serious debate about whether a person's criminal record should impact their access to welfare benefits. Toward the end of the lecture tonight, I'll connect these historical case studies to our flawed system of criminal records today. And we'll conclude tonight by thinking about how this story might inform current efforts to reform our system of criminal background checks. And at the end of the program, I'll turn things over for a couple of questions in the Q&A. Let me begin by offering some context for how new ideas about criminal identity began to emerge during the Industrial Revolution. And essentially, we can think of new techniques of criminal identification as a modern response to an age-old problem. How can you be sure someone is who they say they are? And how do you know someone's trustworthy? Before the 19th century, people generally answered these questions by consulting someone's reputation among people who knew them. So an employer looking to hire someone could ask around their social or professional network to figure out what that person's reputation was. And communities often had a sense of who they could and couldn't trust based on a person's reputation. As I mentioned a moment ago, these older systems for measuring a stranger's trustworthiness began to break down amid the massive changes brought about by the Industrial Revolution. Within growing cities, crime rates spiked in poor neighborhoods as people tried to scrape together a living packed shoulder to shoulder with strangers. I think this scene from New York City's notorious Five Points neighborhood in 1827 gives us a pretty good glimpse into the crowded, often chaotic cityscape that started to emerge in the early 19th century. A typical crime of this period was the so-called crime of confidence, uh, where someone would win someone's trust in order to defraud them and then invent a new identity and start over with another victim. So in crowded cities full of new arrivals, it was just too easy for people to take advantage of each other 
and then totally reinvent themselves by adopting a different identity and moving on to their next victim. Faced with this challenge, police departments needed a new, more complicated system of quickly and reliably figuring out who someone was and what was known about them. So let me illustrate how police developed modern criminal identification techniques by thinking through the ways law enforcement might identify a suspect and connect them with their past record, given the different technologies available to them in different time periods. And here I'm indebted to the work of scholars like Simon Cole, George Pavlich, and Alan Sekula, who work on the history of criminal identification. Um, and I've linked to some of their work in the resource sheet that's available after this lecture. So let's imagine a hypothetical New York Police Department officer in the 1850s who might look something like this image from Gleason's pictorial drawing room companion. Now let's say that this officer arrests the suspect in connection with a bank robbery and wants to record his identity. Um, one way this officer might try and do that is by using words to describe the suspect. So he might write down the suspect's name and some aliases that that suspect is known to use. Um, but this probably isn't enough. After all, the suspect could just invent a new alias or refuse to give any name at all. So our officer might next turn to using words to physically describe the appearance of the suspect. He might write down things like that suspect's height, their weight, their eye color, their complexion, um, tattoos and identifying marks that they have. But this is also pretty inadequate. If you take a look at this record and imagine trying to identify someone based on this description, it's a pretty daunting task. And that was especially true as New York City grew to over a half a million people by the 1850s. And here's a picture of New York from 1865. You can imagine trying to track down someone with dark hair and a medium complexion in a city of this size. It proved pretty impossible for law enforcement at that time. With no better way to describe suspects during this period, the descriptions used by police and prison officials sound pretty amusing to us today. Actual entries used to describe suspects and prisoners from this period included terms like pockmarked, very broad nose, broken foot, speaks low, and my personal favorite, tender-eyed. As you might imagine, officials quickly discovered this was a pretty inadequate way to identify someone. After all, how do you know someone's a repeat offender based on their tender eyes? Let's fast forward to the same problem in the 1870s. Police officials made a huge stride forward in criminal identification with the advent of photography in the mid 19th century. This basically allowed them to make a more exact visual record of what a suspect looked like. Um, and this record of suspects when they're arrested came to be known as a mugshot. And the hope was that this photograph could be used to identify someone if they committed a crime again in the future or to look for a wanted suspect. The problem was that the NYPD quickly amassed thousands of criminal mugshots and they really had no way to quickly sort through all of them. So police found themselves having to compare suspects to photos by hand, uh, sometimes going through hundreds of different photographs to try and match a suspect to their past criminal record. Uh, another problem was it was hard to be sure that someone was the person in the photograph because people's appearances tended to change pretty quickly after their picture was taken. And I can say half of my friends are totally unrecognizable after four months of quarantine. So you can imagine people's appearance changed quite a bit over the course of decades. To help manage their huge collection of criminal records, police officials in New York City in 1858 created what they called a rogues gallery, which was basically a display of 450 criminal mugshots that the public was encouraged to visit and peruse. And the hope was that the public would be able to identify some of the fugitives in the gallery. We can kind of think of this as akin to the modern system of crowdsourcing, where you're getting a willing and cooperative public to help do a really onerous task that takes a lot of labor. As it turns out, a more elegant solution was lying right under police fingertips the entire time, the fingerprint. Humans have understood that every person has unique fingerprints on their fingertips for quite a long time now, but for a long time, it wasn't clear how to make use of these fingerprints on any kind of systemic level. 
And it really wasn't until the 1890s that British colonial officials in India figured out how to describe a set of 10 fingerprints using a series of letters and numbers based on the features of that set of fingerprints. These classifications could then be sorted and filed according to their classification. And this was essentially a way to create a reliable and fast system for classifying and sorting fingerprints according to an abstract language of letters and numbers. So just to give you a sense of what that looked like, uh, by about 1910, it was possible for a police officer to take a set of 10 criminal fingerprints like this one, um, classify them in about a minute into the Henry system classification, which looked like this sort of long fraction of letters and numbers. And then that record could be compared with all the other fingerprints with that classification in their files, allowing them to quickly connect the person whose fingerprints were taken to all their past criminal records in the archive. Fingerprinting was so successful that it quickly replaced or supplemented older systems of criminal identification by the early 20th century. And to this day, it's still the gold standard of most criminal identification and background checks. Arrested suspects are still often fingerprinted when they're booked, and fingerprints are still collected for criminal background checks for everything from teaching licenses to an immigration visa. By 1923, the Bureau of Investigation, which later became the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, was given the task of centralizing, searching, and reporting on criminal records that were sent in by law enforcement agencies around the country. And by the late 1930s, the FBI's criminal database had grown to over 13 million records, making it the largest and most efficient in the world. The FBI could match a suspect's fingerprints to their entire criminal record in a matter of just minutes. Um, to give you a sense of what this pretty remarkable national database looked like, I've prepared a clip from a promotional video produced in collaboration with the FBI in 1936. It's called, You Can't Get Away With It. And the film's ominous title is meant to sort of convey the FBI's powerful new tools for tracking criminals in the 1930s. It includes a really kind of incredible look into the FBI's growing identification division. Let's see if I can get that to play. Now the criminal record. Here they receive fingerprint inquiries from local police authorities at the rate of 4,000 a day. Somebody arrested somewhere. What's his record? Is he a fugitive from justice? Fingerprints are sent to the FBI. The experts conduct a search. The prints sent in are in all 10 fingers. They are searched against 10 finger records. There are more than six and a half million sets of these on file, so classified that the right one can be identified in less than three minutes. There it is, under the magnifying glass it matches. That man's record will be sent to the local police. He's an old offender and can't deny it. A machine can make the search. The fingerprints that we are trying to match have certain characteristics. The mechanism is adjusted accordingly. This adjustment will pick out a punch card perforated to represent the fingerprint characteristics we are looking for. A hundred times as fast as any clerk. There's the card. The punch mark corresponds to a fingerprint card in the file, so we select that one. We match it, and we can't miss. Our fingers have designs of loops, whorls, and lines like a pen. No two individuals have ever been found with fingerprints exactly alike. The chance of a mistake is one in an undefined. The figure one followed by 36 ciphers. This man is wanted for murder. The FBI Fingerprint Service identifies an average of 500 fugitives from justice a month. The service is free to the police everywhere. The police can take a 10 finger. All right, so the reason it's worth dwelling on this history of criminal identification, and this is truly one of the most important things I'll say tonight, is it rested on a narrow set of assumptions about where crime comes from. Now that police and criminal courts could reliably connect a suspect with their entire past criminal record, it became tempting to think of crime as a product of people who are somehow inherently more prone to criminality. And crime fighting during this time became centered on identifying and punishing habitual offenders or so-called recidivists. 
who are assumed to be hardened criminals who are more likely to offend again in the future. Today, many criminologists caution that this way of thinking about criminality obscures other ways we might think about why people commit crime. And these criminologists point out that so-called habitual offenders are often people who are trapped in situations that we know correlate strongly with crime. Things like mental illness, poverty, family troubles, and drug addiction, to name a few examples. These criminologists also point out that the idea of habitual offenders often ignores the role of disproportionate policing in producing these criminal records. So for example, while white people and people of color use and sell drugs at about the same rate, black and Latinx people are far more likely to be arrested, prosecuted, and imprisoned than white people are for these crimes. So the system labels them as more criminal than white people. This revisionist approach to criminology acknowledges that some people might be more prone to committing a crime than others, but argues that we've gone way too far in the direction of trying to deter crime by punishing people after the fact, rather than proactively ensuring that all people have access to dignified, supportive conditions to reach their best personal outcomes and avoid reoffending again in the future. So how does this perspective on criminology relate to background checks? Well, once law enforcement figured out how to centralize and quickly search criminal records, it became tempting to look for fugitives and criminals hiding out in other areas of life, like employment, immigration, and welfare. After all, if fingerprinting helped keep habitual criminals behind bars, law enforcement reasoned that it might also prove useful to keeping them out of positions of public trust or from hiding out in the workforce. As I'll suggest in the rest of my talk, this search for criminals among us made the often spurious assumption that someone with a past criminal record was likely to prove an untrustworthy citizen or coworker long after their sentence had been served. And in many ways, this is the idea animating our vast system of criminal background checks today. As I mentioned, I'm going to focus the rest of this talk on New York in the 1930s, where one of the nation's most advanced police departments battled with a diverse, organized, and powerful working class over the proper limits of criminal records and fingerprinting. And for the rest of my time tonight, I wanna to show you two moments in this fight that helped shape the course of criminal background checks in the United States for the rest of the century. And I think by looking at a moment before background checks were commonplace, we can see more clearly how they fell differently on different groups of Americans and how their critics in the 1930s anticipated a lot of the problems as we see them today. Let's turn to our first case study about a headline grabbing murder to illustrate why law enforcement pushed for workers to be fingerprinted uh, for criminal background checks during the Great Depression. This story starts on January 11th, 1937, when Mary Harriet Case, a 25-year-old white woman and the wife of a successful hotel executive was found brutally murdered in the bathtub of her and her husband's spacious apartment in Jackson Heights, Queens. The police investigation into the murder found that her wedding ring and several of her husband's suits had been stolen from the apartment after she was killed. And police investigating the crime quickly narrowed their search for suspects to the large staff of building service employees whose work in the building brought them into frequent contact with Mrs. Case. They quickly identified a black porter who worked in the building whose name was Major Green, as their chief suspect after he allegedly tried to sell one of the missing suits at a New York laundry. After holding Green without food for more than 40 hours, the police claimed that he confessed to murdering Mrs. Case to a black undercover detective who'd been placed in his cell. Based upon the detective's testimony and a subsequent confession, Green was charged with the crime and swiftly sentenced to death in a sensational trial. All this despite his defender's contention that he wasn't mentally capable to stand trial and that his confession had been forced by starvation. And what I want to suggest is that the case murder became such a big deal in New York City because it played on tensions that were roiling under the surface of depression era New York City. And one of those tensions had to do with the economic calamity of the Great Depression. Um, this was a time of mass unemployment and migration, as millions of Americans lost jobs and hundreds of thousands of people began wandering the country in search of work. 
In cities like New York, shanty towns called Rivervilles popped up all over the city as a sort of temporary housing for people who had been displaced by the depression. Cities quickly found their small systems to care for employed and housed people completely overwhelmed by this tidal wave of people looking for jobs, food, and a place to live. The depression was also a time of major anxiety about crime. And the reason was because the FBI played up the idea that the nation was in the grip of what they described as a crime wave. And they used this to argue that the crime wave couldn't be stopped without coordinated and modern policing. Well, they focused this campaign on colorful criminal gangsters like Al Capone and John Dillinger, this fear of criminality often fell hardest on ordinary people struggling to make ends meet during the depression. Um, and during this time, police stepped up their presence in places like train stations and Hoovervilles where unemployed transients gathered. Um, police in cities like Los Angeles went so far as to form what they called a hobo blockade where they sealed off the county and stopped anyone they suspected of being a transient from entering the county uh, so that they could fingerprint them and run their criminal background. And if that person was found to have a criminal record, they were barred from entering the county. A final factor in this mounting anxiety involved the migration of black workers from the American South to cities in the North. Facing the constant threat of racial violence and Jim Crow segregation in the South, uh, tens of thousands of black migrants arrived in New York City during the early 20th century, largely to take jobs in the city's large multi-ethnic working class. And while these workers often found better employment opportunities and greater personal freedom in Northern cities, black migrants also found themselves the subject of disproportionate harassment and violence by police departments, vigilante white neighbors, and exploitative employers. So I'd say we can think of the case murder as a focal point illustrating these larger tensions in depression era New York. And in particular, the murder highlighted the fact that the city's white middle class depended on the labor of a large pool of racially and ethnically diverse workers in the service industry who washed their clothes, drove their taxi cabs, and staffed the restaurants and nightclubs that entertained them. The case murder literally brought this anxiety home for middle-class New Yorkers. And the reason was some 375,000 building service employees, just like Green, worked in close proximity to affluent tenants in the city's thousands of modern apartment buildings, where they did jobs like operating elevators, stoking coal furnaces, working as domestic servants, and performing building maintenance. These demanding and often low-paid jobs uh, frequently fell to New York City's growing Black population, whose work in these building service jobs brought them into an uneasy intimacy with tenants. And after the case murder, this powder keg of anxiety proved explosive. Just after Green's arrest, a group of white women attacked Green while he was being transferred from the courthouse to the county prison, swinging at him with umbrellas and shouting, lynch him. At the trial's opening, an angry mob of 200 people swarmed the Long Island City Supreme Court building in Queens, leading the Queens County Sheriff to actually assign a detail to protect Green and to warn the crowd that, quote, there shall be no lynch law in Queens. The case also deeply disturbed New York City's Black community, who argued that the sensational murder was being used to justify a surge of racial discrimination across the city. So in the immediate aftermath of the murder, that advocacy group estimated that three to 400 black building service workers around the city had been fired and replaced with white workers, including every single black worker in the building where Green had been employed. In this tense atmosphere, some New Yorkers proposed expanded police oversight of workers in order to protect the public safety. Just a week after the murder, New York Alderman a. Newbold Morris proposed that every building service employee in the city be required to submit their photographs and fingerprints to the NYPD. And the idea was their fingerprints would be run through the NYPD's criminal database so that any employee with a, a felony conviction could be barred from working in the profession. Let's look at how proponents sold this escalation of police surveillance. Morris claimed that his proposal would, quote, 
help restore confidence and a feeling of safety among tenants of New York City. And he went on to claim that these licenses were for building workers' own protection. Quote, since such records will enable them to place themselves beyond suspicion when a crime is committed. The Tenants Defense League heartily endorsed the bill on the grounds that, quote, a man's home is his castle, and it should have every protection that is possible. Note that these arguments drew on the assumption I mentioned earlier, that people with criminal histories would continue to pose a threat after their sentence had been served, and that drumming them out of service jobs would protect the tenants they worked near. The Great Depression was also a time of tense and often violent confrontations between workers and police, um, and an increasingly uh, militant multiracial working class, especially as workers fought to hold on to scarce jobs and wages. Unsurprisingly then, Morris's proposal to fingerprint workers aroused an immediate cry of protest from everyone from the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, to workers, to uh, black residents of the city. These critics pointed out that fingerprinting Green, who didn't even have a felony record before his arrest for the murder, wouldn't have prevented the murder in the first place. And they accused Morris of opportunistically using headline catching crime to implement broader control and harassment of originally, already marginalized workers. The building service workers, uh, employees, Building Service Employees International Union claimed that the union was, quote, unalterably opposed to a fingerprinting law because it is class legislation of the worst kind and we're going to fight it. The New York Committee of the ACLU called it, quote, a grave abuse by employers. And a spokesman for the Communist Party, which was a small but pretty influential radical presence in New York City politics in the 1930s, described the measure as a conspiracy to terrorize black workers and to enact a blacklist against organized labor under the pretext of fighting crime. In newspaper editorials and public hearings, black community leaders and the city's two black aldermen demanded that the measure be rescinded. And faced with this organized coalition of opponents, the fingerprinting measure was quickly defeated just a month after the case murder. The case murder and subsequent failed effort to register building service workers, I think tells us quite a bit about how people understood criminal background checks in the 1930s. And I'd say first it shows us that uh, a headline catching crime could easily become a pretext for a set of surveillance measures that didn't have much to do with the crime in the first place. As I mentioned, Major Green didn't even have a criminal record before his arrest. Second, I think this case shows that while officials claimed these efforts were for the protection of the public, support for them broke sharply along class and racial lines. Working people often understood them as a cynical pretext for creating what they saw as an unholy alliance between employers and law enforcement that didn't even protect anyone from crime. And they stood up to defeat these measures when they became a matter of public debate. Across the country during the 1930s, Scores of cities and states enacted fingerprinting measures during this decade, often aimed at the people least able to resist them, like transients, low-wage workers, and professions staffed mostly by racial minorities. Organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union kept a close eye on these measures, but there are so many of them around the country, and really very few ways that the ACLU could legally challenge them, that there wasn't much that anyone could do to stop them. Um, this is part of a public relations campaign that ACLU launched in 1938. Uh, I love this pamphlet. It's called Thumbs Down, The Fingerprint Menace to Civil Liberties. This is really one of the only ways that the ACLU could find to combat these measures at such a large scale. Let's turn to a second case study to show just how far these fingerprinting measures went in the 1930s. It was one thing to deny someone a license or employment because of their criminal background, but what about denying them welfare benefits during the worst economic disaster in American history? Let me offer a little bit of context here. During the Great Depression, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt backed a suite of programs called the New Deal to provide some measure of security to millions of ordinary people. And these included work relief programs that employed hundreds of thousands of people in giant public, public works programs. 
As these new government relief programs expanded, some administrators began fingerprinting work relief recipients in order to deny aid to people with a criminal record. But as millions of people struggle to pay their bills and hold on to their homes during a time of economic calamity, opponents of these fingerprinting measures argue that denying someone welfare benefits because of a criminal record went too far. And they felt that forcing some of the most vulnerable people to submit their fingerprints treated them like potential criminals, ensuring that people with a criminal past would never be able to get back on their feet. Here again, New York City was a key battleground. And the controversy in New York City revolved around the New York City branch of an organization called the Works Progress Organization, or the WPA, which is widely considered one of the most successful work relief programs of the Great Depression. The WPA hired hundreds of thousands of unemployed people to provide services like education, performances, public art, um, and the construction of valuable infrastructure like libraries, schools, and parks that really remain an important part of New York City today. The controversy in New York City began in 1938 when the WPA's New York City administrator, Lieutenant Colonel Brahan B. Somerville, and these New Deal names are kind of crazy, hard to make up. Uh, Somerville proposed fingerprinting applicants as a measure to protect the organization from scandals that might be caused by admitting criminals to the agency. And he went so far as to claim that several WPA employees had been involved in sexual misconduct toward children in their care. And I should mention that most of Somerville's contemporaries in the WPA who looked into this matter accused him of exaggerating or even inventing these supposed crimes, um, mostly as a sort of cynical pretext for fingerprinting WPA workers. And my own research hasn't been able to corroborate that these crimes actually occurred. Um, under Somerville's plan, tens of thousands of WPA employees in New York City would be fingerprinted so that those with a criminal background could either be demoted or dismissed according to the nature of their criminal history. Unsurprisingly, Somerville's order immediately provoked outrage from workers within the, the WPA, the ACLU, labor unions, and even some other WPA administrators. And most of these critics didn't argue that common sense measures to screen WPA applicants were necessary, but they felt that specifically using fingerprinting made WPA workers a target of scorn and humiliation by treating them like criminals, undermining their status as workers with dignity in the eyes of the public. The ACLU framed this as an effort to expand fingerprinting piecemeal against groups like welfare recipients who had the least power to oppose it. And they argued that using a person's criminal history to demote them overlooked potentially extenuating circumstances explaining their criminal charges. These critics argued that the WPA should be a place for second chances, not a second round of punishment for past mistakes. And I can say I've spent many hours in the WPA archives looking into this moment in its history. And those records suggest that the supposedly authoritative information in the FBI's criminal records didn't always tell the full story of a WPA worker's criminal history. Criminal records often reduced really complicated life events into a short one-line entry on a rap sheet. And in contrast, the records of WPA workers appealing their demotions offer a pretty surprising amount of detail and context about their criminal past and work with the WPA. These workers cited their actual performance on the job and corroborated their records of loyal service to the WPA through job reviews and letters from supervisors. And many of them argued that the most relevant predictor of their future value to the WPA was their past performance on the job, not a criminal offense from a long time ago. Let's take a look at an example to show how this worked. This is the criminal record of Jacob Levy. He was a WPA worker whose fingerprints were sent to the FBI under the new fingerprinting order in 1940. And the FBI returned this document to the WPA, showing that Levy had been arrested on a homicide charge back in 1931, which was dismissed without conviction. And it showed that Levy had then been sentenced to a robbery charge in 1932, which earned him a sentence at the state prison in Ossining, New York. Because of his 
because of this piece of paper from the FBI, Levy was demoted from a foreman position earning $85 per month to a manual laborer position earning just $53. But let's take a moment to consider what's missing from a criminal history like this one by looking at Levy's appeal to his demotion. In his appeal file, Levy and his advocates claim that this brief document of his criminal history didn't tell the whole story. Levy argued that he'd pleaded guilty to the robbery under duress after accidentally being implicated in the crime when some friends picked him up in a car one night that contained property stolen in a robbery. In his letters of appeal to the WPA, Levy worried that being in the wrong place at the wrong time eight years earlier would not only cost him his job at the WPA, but would follow him in the private employment long after. One of his coworkers wrote a letter on his behalf to First Lady uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, arguing that if the federal government is to kick those who are down, how can we expect the private employer to do otherwise? Roosevelt was so moved by the letter that she forwarded his case to the WPA for reconsideration. 10 of Levy's coworkers and supervisors co-signed a letter in support of his reinstatement, in which they argued that his five-year record of good work at the WPA proved he was not a threat as an employee. Even the acting director of the WPA's Labor Division of Employment argued that the facts didn't warrant Levy's demotion and advised that he be reinstated as a foreman. But despite all of this, Somerville held firm, saying that Levy couldn't be reassigned because, quote, we do not wish to have an employee assigned to a supervisory position who has so patent a disregard for the law. He denied Levy's appeal, forcing him to either leave the, the WPA or to accept a severe demotion. The extent of this fingerprinting order is pretty surprising. Within three years, Somerville's order caused the forced fingerprinting of 50,000 WPA recipients in New York City leading the agency to pursue demotions or terminations of about 1,400 workers. In keeping with the themes I introduced earlier about identity and age of documentation, I think cases like Levy's pose really important questions about workers' identities and age of large bureaucracies and easily searched criminal records. When doubts arose about a worker's suitability as an employee, which was more authoritative? the opinion of coworkers and immediate supervisors who knew them personally, character references, performance reviews, and the worker's own explanation of events on one hand, or a brief entry like this one on an FBI rap sheet on the other. Once a criminal record cast doubt upon someone, how much evidence was enough to prove they're suited for a job? How could administrators tell the difference between someone with so-called criminal character and someone who'd been the victim of police harassment or had simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Ultimately, the theory of the habitual criminal won out over these more contextualized ways of assessing a person's risk as an employee. And in the coming years, the experiment in the New York City branch of the WPA became a model for how fingerprint records could be used to identify and take action against applicants with a criminal history and government programs. These case studies from New York City represent just a handful of the dozens of federal, state, and local fingerprinting measures that I've identified throughout the United States during the Great Depression. By the eve of the United States entry into World War II in 1941, fingerprinting had expanded from a relatively narrow technique of criminal identification to a much broader tool for scrutinizing applicants for a growing number of licenses, work relief benefits, and some forms of employment. In an editorial in Fingerprint Magazine 1939, New York City Police Commissioner Louis Valentine summed up the challenges of law enforcement in the Depression era and how fingerprinting was helping revolutionize the government's ability to respond. Quoting Valentine, the increasing complexities of our modern civilization with rapid transportation and a vast floating population created by disturbed economic conditions make such a system an urgent social necessity. He went on to write that in our country, an almost overwhelming burden has been placed on the police to locate and identify out of our vast transient population, not only the criminal, but missing persons, including those who abandon families to become public charges. He concluded to the civic minded person, fingerprinting is an added assurance of individual liberty.
Responding to Valentine in the same issue of Fingerprint Magazine, ACLU attorney Morris L. Ernst framed the drive toward ever broader fingerprinting in a darker light. And I think in a lot of ways anticipated the currently disordered state of criminal records today. If broader fingerprinting were to be implemented, Ernst worried, this could provide occasion for governments to restrict people's movement across borders and could allow law enforcement an excuse to harass people in more and more parts of their life, like when they crossed the border, moved into a new home, or took a new job. Besides its ramifications for individual liberty, Ernst worried that fingerprinting also framed the problem of crime as merely one of detecting criminals rather than, quote, addressing the causes of crime. For instance, bad food, disgraceful slums, and unintelligent education. At a time when authoritarian regimes abroad were rearing their ugly heads in Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia, Ernst warned that a large fingerprint archive was ripe for abuse by a power-hungry strongman. Dictatorial administrators could easily use these records to persecute economically marginal people, political dissidents, and racial minorities, who would surely be the target of increased scrutiny. At its core, Ernst argued, using fingerprints to demonstrate a person's moral good standing in order to claim the benefits of citizenship forced conformity and quashed more expansive ideas of belonging in a democratic society. I think really nothing captures this anxiety felt by liberals and leftists in the 1930s about the growth of fingerprinting background, of fingerprinting and background checks better than this cartoon by the radical artist William Cropper. Um, and the cartoon shows Lady Liberty sort of bowing her head in shame as she's fingerprinted by a menacing looking FBI agent. And the drawing was a response to a federal law passed in 1940 that required all foreign aliens residing inside the United States to be fingerprinted in the name of national security. Gropper and a lot of his contemporaries on the political left saw this measure as a hypocritical reversal of Lady Liberty's promise of openness to immigrants and new ideas. Um, by treating non-citizens and aliens living in the country as potential criminals or saboteurs. These dark predictions proved remarkably insightful as the United States veered from the national emergency of the Great Depression to the even greater national emergency of entering World War II. During the war, the limited fingerprinting measures that had been used to surveil transient service workers and relief applicants at the margins of society during the Depression were quickly expanded to the purpose of screening millions of aliens living in the United States, as well as tens of millions of defense workers, military recruits, and civil servants. At a scale that would have been pretty unimaginable before the war, the FBI's fingerprinting operation grew so large by the 1940s that it had to temporarily relocate to this giant armory just outside of Washington, DC, where it employed workers in three shifts around the clock to answer thousands of fingerprint searches every single day. By the end of the war, the number of fingerprint cards in the FBI's collection had grown to a whopping 95 million records, comprising records on over 55 million people. After the war, this increasingly casual use of criminal records seeped into almost every corner of American life. And by the 1970s, a federal judge reviewing the rapidly growing system of criminal records and background checks described that system as, quote, out of effective control, full of potentially damning information that was hard for people to challenge and increasingly visible to an ever wider range of actors in the private sphere. In the 1970s, private companies began offering their own criminal background checks, circumventing even the small restrictions that government checks could be used. As I mentioned at the beginning of tonight's lecture, this system is now so widespread that many people take for granted the severe costs it imposes on people with a criminal record in the name of public safety. So why focus on a moment from nearly 100 years ago to explain the system today? What I hope I've demonstrated tonight is that the explosion of criminal background checks began pretty early in the 20th century and had its origins in new technological and administrative changes that allowed governments to efficiently collect, search, and share criminal records. These changes reinforced an approach to criminology uh, centered on detecting crime and punishing individuals rather than taking a broader perspective on the causes of crime. 
And when first introduced in places like New York City, these background checks were highly controversial. They're seen by many people as a measure that boosted the power of employers and law enforcement at the expense of workers and groups who are harassed by police. Expanded fingerprinting was often imposed without a lot of public debate during times of perceived emergency. And it removed administrators' discretion to use more contextual systems for screening applicants, paving the way for the vast system of criminal background checks that we have today. As we reconsider the downstream consequences of our massive system of policing, incarceration, and criminal background checks today, I think this historical perspective can help us way, think of ways to screen applicants that provide for public safety without consigning millions of Americans to permanent second class status. And indeed, there have been some pretty amazing strides forward on reforming the system in the last decade. Um, in recent years, 35 states and 150 municipalities have adopted measures to make the system more fair and contextual by passing so-called ban the box or fair chance legislation. And what this does is it limits employers' ability to ask about a person's criminal background until later in the application process. So for example, in New York City, the city council passed a measure in 2015 that makes it illegal for employers to ask about an applicant's criminal history until the end of the hiring process. And if a candidate is denied a job based on their criminal history, employers have to show in writing that the applicant's criminal history is relevant to the job or benefit they're being considered for. And along the way, applicants are allowed to submit contextualizing information to show that they've been rehabilitated or to offer context to their criminal convictions. Echoing the conversation among workers and civil liberties advocates nearly a century ago, scholars and activists studying recidivism today find that former convicts are unlikely to pose a risk as employees and that their risk of reoffending declines significantly if able to find employment. For example, a recent study of formerly incarcerated people found that recidivism rates were about 52% overall over the course of three years but only 16% for people with at least one year of employment after their release. Furthermore, research suggests that employers are typically satisfied with the work of former convicts and that allowing convicts broader access to the workforce, uh, former convicts broader access to the workforce mutually benefits them, their families, and taxpayers. Before moving on to our Q&A tonight, I wanna to conclude by saying that I think history matters in our contemporary conversations about reforming criminal justice in the United States. Like our historical forebears a century ago, we have to think carefully and skeptically about how seemingly promising technologies for law enforcement might end up shifting the balance of power between governments, employers, workers, and those communities who already face disproportionate police surveillance and criminal suspicion. What I hope my talk tonight shows is that even as legal efforts to reform policing and criminal records have made significant progress in recent years, these reforms take place against an evolving technological and administrative backdrop whose effects might take decades for us to fully unpack. These long-term changes require long-term thinking, which I hope I've been able to show tonight means thinking historically about the longer history of criminal identification privacy and policing as it's unfolded over the last century. I wanna thank all of you for being here tonight and I'll now hand things over to Maeve and Hannah to field a couple of questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much for sharing this with us this, for this your collecting of all of this scholarship and also your own on top of it. So. We're now going to, in a moment, turn to Q&A. I know we've been seeing comments coming in throughout the talk, knowing that this has an impactful talk and the content, Dan, that you've been sharing has even moved some of our listeners here. So while I give a few final sort of details here, please feel free. If you have a question for Dan, now's the time. Go ahead and put it into the Q&A feature. This is separate from the chat feature, which is the chat is just going privately to those of us running this, but please put a question into the Q&A session, uh, the Q&A portion, and then we will open up that session. Um, in the meantime, as we're having those questions coming in, 
A few takeaways from this talk. First, that the topic of reforming criminal justice is top of mind for many right now. And having this historical perspective can help us put in place this understanding of the fact that things today are not the way that they are by accident, but there have been debates over how, how technologies such as background checks and fingerprints have been deployed. And it's important to understand these debates and understand this historical perspective as we move forward in the contemporary conversation. It's also important, this question that Dan raised, this idea of is a person inherently criminal and how long should records follow a person? And how do we even understand or conceptualize the idea of a quote unquote criminal in our society? And finally, another takeaway that I have from listening to Dan's talk this evening is the unequal application and the unequal effects, especially along lines of race and class here in New York City on account of these technologies. So again, we're about to open it up for Q&A. If you've enjoyed this talk, I hope you will also consider joining us for our program tomorrow night, which is on New York's Communities of Color and the Police, a Historical Perspective. It will be a panel discussion moderated by veteran TV journalist Carol Jenkins, who will lead three distinguished professors of African American history in an incredible conversation about the complex roots of our cities and our nation's ongoing crisis of policing, focusing on key moments from the 1920s through the 1980s. Again, that will be tomorrow night, and you can find it on our website to go ahead and register. So now, opening it up, Dan, to some questions that have come in. Um, the first question is about the parameters of the time period in which you are studying. We had some folks wondering, you know, why not earlier? Why not later? And I know a lot of this comes from the fact that it's impossible to study too large a time period. Otherwise, you will never leave the archives. But curious. What in particular drew you to this time period that you focused on in your dissertation and in this talk? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the things we're always being asked to do as historians is defend what's called our periodization or the period that we're choosing to study and why we've kind of broken things down the way we do. So this is a great question. Um, basically, I'm trying to fill a gap in the scholarship. Uh, we know a lot from some more recent work done by people in criminology and legal studies about criminal background checks since the 1970s. And I think these studies often kind of portray criminal background checks as a very recent development and part of this broader turn toward incarceration after the 1970s. At the same time, we have a lot of work on criminal identification and its growth during the 19th and early 20th century. So what I'm trying to do here is bridge that gap between these two different scholarship traditions and essentially say that the techniques that emerged in criminal identification back in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, made their way into civil life, made their way into criminal background checks a lot earlier than the 1970s and in a totally different historical context. In a time of the Great Depression, of World War II, um, and some of the anxiety that was caused by the Cold War. So my bigger dissertation project goes from about 1900 to 1980 to cover that period when a lot of these measures really started to take off. And by the time computerized records and the expansion of mass incarceration came about after the 1970s, that system was largely already in place and had been pretty well established uh, by the, the processes and the measures that I've described in this lecture and some of the other ones that I'm working on in my research. A couple questions that are um, on particular different points of your talk, but there are questions of comparison. So I'll throw two of them out to you and then um, feel free to tackle whichever or both as you see fit. One is a comparison between the U.S. and other countries. So you had, at the beginning of your talk, you showed the U.S. and Europe, and you mentioned briefly how it is different in Europe. There for many, I guess that's too broad <laughs> to say Europe in this case, each country has their own laws. Um, but there were some questions about 
elsewhere beyond the US and Europe, so some perhaps even a non-Western perspective. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that if your research has touched on it. And then the other, another comparison question that came in was um, to digital surveillance and questions about DNA and how other forms of new technologies of surveillance are are being used and how you see that in light of your research into these now older forms of older uh, technologies of fingerprinting. Great, okay, also two really excellent questions. Uh, the first one is pretty challenging, so bear with me as I work through this, but I think because the United States and Europe have uh, kind of a similar legal tradition and uh, both participated in processes of colonization during the 19th century and exchanged a lot of policy information with each other, there's kind of a natural comparison between the United States and Europe. And because of that, people have made a lot out of the very different rates of incarceration between European countries today and the United States today. And I wanna to nod to some incredible work that's being done in the global history of mass incarceration right now. That's really kind of upsetting that easy comparison between the United States and Europe. And what that scholarship is saying is that if you look in the broader global context that what Europe was doing in some of its colonies, like if you look at France, which had a colony in what's today Vietnam, the same dynamics of mass incarceration and uh, using incarceration as a tool of racial control were happening in those colonies as were happening in parts of the United States. So I think this kind of comparison between the United States and Europe is sort of a natural place to reach, but there's some really great scholarship that's kind of forcing us to think a lot harder about that in the global history of mass incarceration today. Um, I think that's something we need to pay a lot of attention to. As far as new technologies of surveillance, I think this is uh, a pretty daunting thing that's on our horizon. And I wanna to nod to a couple cases that I've been following really carefully over the course of the COVID pandemic and kind of in this broader moment of uh, talk about reforming the criminal justice system. Uh, it's now coming out that some governments are using people's cell phone data to track their movements during the pandemic um, and using that cell phone data to warn people who've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19. And this is a pretty concerning development. Uh, this is a relatively new capability that some of these um, governments have for tracking people. I think it's important that we think not only about the really short-term consequences of using information and establishing precedent for using information that way, but I think we also have to keep a longer-term perspective on some of the potential consequences in allowing that much power over our data to fall into the hands of governments uh, without a lot of challenge in this time of emergency. So I think this story about fingerprinting in the 1930s is pretty relevant to some of these other stories about surveillance that are emerging today. And I wanna nod to another really interesting case which happened in Detroit, I think at the beginning of this year. Uh, Detroit has been working with this new facial recognition software and that facial recognition software identified a suspect from a crime several years earlier. And based on a facial recognition match, Detroit police arrested a man and charged him with that crime. Uh, but it came out later that this person was falsely identified by facial recognition. And uh, there's now this big controversy over these new technologies that law enforcement are using, in particular because they're often racially biased. So facial recognition doesn't work as well for people of color as it does for white faces, which a lot of the uh, algorithms that are used to build these systems are based on. So I think we're seeing all this happen in real time. Uh, and we have this, I think, kind of incredible story of how this evolved during the last century and haven't really internalized those lessons as these new technologies of DNA and retinal scanning and facial recognition are popping up all over the world today. I'm sure we could sit here for a whole other hour trying to unpack current conversations and debates um, and 
it is important right now to be aware of the fact that just as now, Dan, you are looking to the past to unpack what these debates were 70, 90 years ago, those same or similar debates are happening right now all around us in New York City and beyond. Um, another question asks, can you comment on any connections between the development of fingerprinting and policies related to undocumented immigration? And I'll extend that as well to um, if there's any conversations related to undocumented immigration and surveillance at this moment as well. Yeah, this is a uh, part of my research that I'm working on right now. Uh, the week before COVID happened, I was in the National Archives in DC, looking at immigration records and how the United States uh, began fingerprinting immigrants to the United States in the 1930s and 1940s. And what I think is going on, and this is still early, uh, early days of my research into this topic, is uh, during the 1930s, several states started passing measures that banned so-called criminal aliens from uh, residing in the state. So they required all non-citizens living in the state to submit their fingerprints. And if someone had a criminal record, they would take measures to get that person to leave the state. And this happened on a federal level in 1940 when the Smith Act was passed. This was a, a national security bill that was passed and it's what led to this cartoon of Lady Liberty being fingerprinted. So my understanding right now, and I'm still working on figuring out this really complicated history, is that fingerprinting immigrants really started in the 1930s and 1940s in this moment when the United States had closed its border to mass immigration after 1924, when the US passed pretty serious immigration restrictions. Um, and it also happened against the backdrop of fighting World War II and these bigger concerns about national security in wartime. Uh, and obviously that expanded during the 20th century um, in ways that I'm still documenting as I kind of work my way forward in my research. Thank you. I'm trying to, I know we only have a few more minutes. I'm, I'm sorting through these great questions that are coming in here. Um, we have a couple of questions centering around, I think we have time maybe for two more questions, one of which I'm, I'm summarizing here from a number of different inquiries, which is focusing on race and how much of the U.S. incarceration policies can be traced back to slavery, questions around interpretations of the 13th Amendment, especially during Reconstruction, which I know is earlier than your research, but I'm, you talked a lot about racial discrimination specifically with these technologies or how they could be used to do such. And I'm wondering whether there's any, um, I guess whether you have any comments, additional comments on that from what you shared in your talk in terms of how these tools could be used for racial discrimination. Yeah, I think this is an extremely important question and I encourage you to tune into the panel tomorrow for more discussion about the connections between policing and communities of color in New York City. Um, but my, this is not necessarily my area of expertise, but it's something that I've thought a lot about in my training to uh, take my general exams. And I think my work is sort of part of a, a new wave of scholarship that's trying to think about how new ways of thinking about social science and the way that we handle information early in the 20th century um, connected older systems of racial control during the time of slavery to modern policing institutions that developed really during the 20th century. Uh, so there's an excellent book called The Condemnation of Blackness by Khalil Gibran Muhammad, who's at Harvard, that talks about how social science was used to kind of depict people of color as more criminal than white people in growing northern cities like Philadelphia and New York. And I'm really inspired by Muhammad's work and thinking a lot about how this kind of new quote unquote modern technology that emerged at the beginning of the 20th century took these older assumptions about race and found a way to work them into this modern regimen of information collection and uh, these new kind of tools that law enforcement was using. Uh, specifically, a kind of interesting fact I'll point out is that the FBI began using fingerprint records to create what they called uniform crime reports in the 1930s. 
And these basically reported out how much crime they thought was happening around the United States based on fingerprint records that were coming in from local police departments. And right now I'm spending a lot of time looking at those and how they, I think, way over-report crime in communities of color because those are the communities that face the most police harassment. So here you have a tool that's uh, kind of presenting itself as an objective statement of how much crime is happening in the country. And I'm trying to think about how that supposedly objective measure of crime is probably informed by a lot of day-to-day -day, uh, disproportionate harassment of communities of color and a lot of racial discrimination in policing. I think it's important to keep that skepticism on these tools that call themselves objective that emerged during the 20th century. I think we have time for two more questions. So the second to last question is um, looking forward. Are there ways of screening without discriminating against people or how can ways of tracking crimes and solving crimes go hand in hand with privacy? So looking ahead, what are some of your thoughts or what scholarship can you share here on what are ways forward? Yeah, I think this is also an excellent question. Um, I'll try and tackle the two parts of it. First, I think it's well known that police departments in the United States don't always do a great job of solving crimes. So there's definitely more investment to be made in solving crimes that have a real impact on people's quality of life. Um, and particularly in poorer neighborhoods, it's common that police aren't able to solve really serious crimes like homicides. Um, so perhaps some better investment in investigative tools and less investment in things like broken windows policing is one way that reformers have tried to address that question. Um, I'm a little ambivalent on that just because of my skepticism of how these tools uh, might be used to just justify further racial discrimination. Uh, and the other side of that question is how can we screen applicants without kind of um, reifying this discrimination against people with criminal backgrounds? I think the people who are working on fair chance legislation are doing a great job developing those tools right now and also coming up with the research to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So in particular, their big insight is that by giving employers more context about someone's arrest and their criminal history um, and delaying that information till later in the application process, when a person has been able to show what a good applicant they are, uh, that significantly reduces the chance that someone's going to be dismissed out of hand because of a criminal record. Um, and I linked in the resource sheet to a couple of the uh, research, uh, research articles that are being cited by fair chance advocates to kind of promote these policies and study their effects as they start going into place. So I think that's a great place to turn to answer that question. Great. And again, for those who may have joined us later, the resource sheet that Dan is mentioning is a detailed outline of his talk, as well as a list of additional resources and sources that he's suggesting. And that can be found on the event page on the website for this program. You can go ahead and download that resource sheet. So Dan, one final question as we go to wrap up here. Um, you know, your talk is examining this moment where there's especially debates around this increase in the use of fingerprinting, this debates around the increase of background checks. And yet now, as you said in your talk, it is a very common practice. And many of us, uh, perhaps even most of us, have gone through background checks of one form or another for employment. So what is what are some takeaways from how that how it became normalized, how background checks and fingerprinting became normalized that you think could be useful to keep in mind as we look at contemporary debates around future technologies? I'd say a lot of what we see happening in the 1930s is there's a very coordinated campaign being directed by J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI at that time, to try and push these fingerprinting measures on local communities. Um, and I found these incredible documents where Hoover is having his field agents around the country assess what measures are already in place so that he can kind of strategically advocate for local communities, local police departments to start 
putting some of these measures in place. So I think on one hand, you have this very coordinated campaign advocating for these changes, and you have often very fragmented resistance to them. So in New York, where you have a pretty large and uh, relatively organized working class, there's some pushback to these measures. But in places that don't have that kind of robust left-wing coalition, there isn't a lot of force to stop that coordinated campaign to expand fingerprinting measures. Um, and the other part of that answer is one way to kind of squelch debate about policy changes is by saying that we're in a time of emergency. And because we're in the midst of an emergency, we need to make these changes happen now and we can talk about their effects later. Um, so you kind of saw this in the war on terror and the Patriot Act, for example, but people are doing the same thing in the 1930s and 1940s, especially uh, saying this is a time of total economic disaster. We have all these transients wandering the country. There's a crime wave. There's a war going on. We need to implement these measures in order to protect our security. So that kind of atmosphere of emergency gets people to accept things that they might not accept under normal circumstances. Um, so I think we need to be really suspicious of that and kind of question these emergency mindsets that advocates of some of these measures are trying to get us worked into. And think instead about ways that we can protect people in a way that doesn't require these kind of uh, broad and sometimes uh, not very careful measures that reduce people's status in the law and in employment. Thank you, Dan. Well, you've asked us to be suspicious, but you've certainly given us a lot to think about and a lot to interrogate in terms of how this process and how criminal justice reform is being discussed today and will be in the future. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thank you for joining us, everyone on this call. And again, please go ahead to the website, download the resource sheet. Dan has put together a fantastic list of other resources and websites and books to go to that can help continue this conversation. On behalf of all of us here at the Museum of the City of New York, thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening and we'll see you again at our next program. Have a good night. Thanks for coming everyone. Thank you.